Hello class, this is Dr. Todd Harden. I'll be your instructor in this course, Introduction to Pastoral Counseling at Johnson University. I have not figured out how to solve the problem of omnipresence, and therefore, I've for this first lesson, I've had to record the lecture. I want you to watch the lecture closely, take good notes. At the end of the lecture, there will be um, a time frame a very limited time frame for you to take a quiz on the lecture. So make sure you take good notes. You can pause it as many times as you need to and then work through it. But that's that's how we're going to do this lesson and maybe one more through the semester. With that said, let me get started on the first installment here, if you will, of, of our lectures. And uh, the title of this lecture is called The History of Soul Care. And there are some big ideas that we need to get across as we seek to think about uh, biblical counseling, Christian counseling. Reality number one, regardless of who people are, they're hurting and they're looking for answers. That's not uh, stopped anytime soon. Uh, it, hasn't, it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. So, so we'll always have hurting people. And, and God calls the church to be ministers in a, in a lost and dying world, and that's part of our role here, and that's part of what we're going to learn in this class. But that's the first big reality as we move into this class. The second big reality is that 40% of people looking for help seek members of the clergy or church leadership first. And that's a very important statistic because it shows us that the church is on the front lines of helping people with their soul problems. And so keep that in mind as we move forward. It brings us to a third reality. And that third reality is, in a secularized culture, the church runs the risk of being unable to provide a distinctively Christian answer to these hurting people. What do we have to sell that's better than what an unbeliever has to sell? Well, you and I know that answer. But we have to be able to articulate it in a way that's winsome, logical, and helpful, and applied appropriately to individuals struggling with soul problems. So with those realities in mind, I guess if I could sum up this course in kind of one question, not only this course, but actually the, the lecture particularly that we're talking about here, is what makes counseling distinctively Christian. It's a very big word, distinctively Christian. What makes it of the Christian persuasion? And, and this lecture will seek to answer that question. Uh, hopefully we will find the answers we're searching for. So let's, let's move on with the lecture. First of all, counseling is distinctively Christian in its historical formation. Those that counsel from a Christian perspective stand in a long line of people in our faith tradition that came before us, and they had a lot to offer uh, in the history of soul care. Long before modern soul care, modern psychology uh, came to the forefront, people were helping other people within the church. I think about the Puritan era, uh, it was probably the zenith of soul care from a Christian perspective. And there are still things that uh, one can use from their insights in the 1600s, for instance, that's very, very appropriate in today's soul care environment or in, in, in today's contemporary uh, mental health uh, therapeutic culture. And so... We need to understand that, that we do stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I think if you lose sight of that, it's very easy to slide off that hill into uh, a secularized version of counseling. So, so think about that, and I want to give you a little historical context here. Maybe a little history lesson would be helpful. First of all, um, those that think about psychology always start, if you look at any Psych 101 textbook, it always starts with Sigmund Freud. Uh, Freud's the father of psychoanalysis. Uh, and this is pretty much where any, if you take an integration class at Johnson or anywhere else, 
uh, or if you just take Psych 101 in an undergraduate level kind of course, you're going to, to, to start with Freud and, and his way of thinking. Now, there are some things that Freud touched upon that I believe held true, but there's a great number of things that he totally missed, and he missed because he, he was not standing on the same shoulders that you and I stand as Christians. Um, because Freud stood on someone else's shoulders. Um, Freud was a committed evolutionist. Uh, he was Darwinian, uh, and he had a, a he, he saw religion actually as, as, as neurotic. And so um, he stood on the wrong shoulders. He built his house on the wrong foundation. And I think that that will, that will be shown uh, to show some of the inconsistencies in his thinking. But anyway, that's a problem for us if we want to counsel from a distinctively Christian position. Because instead of Darwin's shoulders, uh, I think we need to, to stand on the shoulders of someone who can bear the weight of the world's problems, namely Jesus Christ. And I think that um, it just makes better sense to start there. You know, the Bible teaches us that God has spoken through His Son. And I think we're wise to remember that. So let's kind of move forward by building on a proper foundation uh, and see where this takes us in our counseling uh, approach. All right. Following Christ, there were some disciples who have taught us things about how we can execute the task, task of soul care Christianly. Now, now many of these individuals some of which you've heard of, some of which you have not heard of, were great influences to me in my life and in my development as a counselor and as a theologian. And so uh, I'll bring them up simply because I want you to see where I'm coming from. Not necessarily that I agree with all the theology of everyone presented here, but there were certain aspects that each one of these individuals uh, taught me and helped me understand and build a coherent, semi-coherent anyway, I hope, Christian worldview. So let's, let's begin with some of these individuals that have influenced me that will then uh, flow into to your development as counselors. First, uh, the French theologian John Calvin. Uh, he helps us understand uh, the role that Scripture plays in interpreting reality. Calvin said that the Scripture served as a set of spectacles that helped us interpret God's creation rightly. And so apart from our spectacles, we cannot see clearly. But when we have them on, we can read very clearly. And Calvin reminds us that God gave us his word, this self-revealing God gave us his word to serve as those lenses. And so I think that's where we need to start as far as a foundation goes. So that's where Calvin influenced me, and, and hopefully that aspect of Calvin will influence you as well. In addition, there was a, a lesser-known individual by many of you by, by the name of Hermann Duiveerd. Uh, he was a Dutch, Dutch Christian philosopher. And Duiveerd conceptualized something that be, became known as the Christian ground motive. This Christian ground motive uh, looks at uh, the redemptive story and breaks it into three, but we can add four, four parts to it. And that, that's creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And that's going to shape very much how we proceed in understanding a, a person's story as they come to us. So Dewey Veard is credited with that. Another individual who's still alive today is a, a fellow by the name of John Frame. Uh, John Frame helps us organize human experience within that story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And, and Frame looks at things from different perspectives. He sees a, a situational perspective, things that are coming at a person. He sees things from an existential perspective, things that are coming out of the person. And then he sees things from a normative perspective, uh, how God requires us to respond to those things coming out of us and at, uh, and at us. And so you'll see Frame's work also playing a part in what we're learning over the semester. In addition to Frame, um, the first true probably Christian psychologist, if you want to call him that, I don't know if he would want to be called that, but, but Soren Kierkegaard, uh, he was a Dutch Christian philosopher, and, and he really helps us understand the reality 
of the subconscious in human experience. Um, long, if, if you'll think about the dates there, Kierkegaard dies the year before Freud is born. And one of the, the big uh, lasting legacies that, that Freud is credited with is, is the idea of the iceberg where, where there's this subconscious and everything's under, under the water, or most of it is. There's only, we only see a tip of the top. Well, uh, Kierkegaard uh, understood that long before Freud was born. Uh, he, he writes a story in a book called Concluding Unscientific Postscript where he talks about how people are under a prodigious illusion. And he's, what he's talking about is um, that people are self-deceived. They don't understand uh, their own uh, issues many times because they can't see them. And he says that uh, what you have to do is if you, if you go straight in on somebody that's under this illusion, it'll only strengthen the illusion. So you have to, you have to sneak up from behind, if you will, which sounds very uh, psychodynamic in its orientation, but it was long before that. Uh, he tells a story of a young preacher who uh, would be naive and thinking that, that that didn't really exist, and he would want to preach on something like cheap grace to his congregation. He said two things you could always be uh, depend upon if you were, uh, if you were there, and uh, number one would be that everyone agreed with the, the young preacher and number two, that everybody would be convinced he was talking about someone else. And so, so Kierkegaard really did some, some really solid work on understanding um, the subconscious, the unconscious, if you will. And, and that's going to play prominently into what we learn. Not only Kierkegaard, uh, Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer was really more of an evangelist than a philosopher. But he was, he, was, he was pretty good at a lot of things, and he might have missed uh, some of the details uh, on some of his philosophy. But the big picture, he got right. And, and the main thing that, that we can attribute to Schaefer as far as this class is concerned is that he helps us know that there is a God who is there, and that God is spoken. And so he, he basically teaches us that when you loosen uh, your psychology from the moorings of Scripture, what will tend to happen is it will go off the rails. Uh, and the natural concerns of, of humankind will uh, eat up, is how he would pretty much call it, eat up the things of the Spirit. And so, so that's very important in, in how we, we learn to counsel. So Schaefer, Schaefer is credited with that. In addition to Schaefer, um, John Owen, the English uh, Christian theologian, uh, probably the greatest theologian uh, that the Puritans produced, helps us understand many things, but, but the things that really come to mind here are, are how indwelling sin is so pervasive. Not sinful behaviors, but a state of being. And how, how it is so important for us to experience union with Christ uh, and, and for those that we're helping to increase and deepen their union with Christ. Uh, those are kind of some of Owen's lasting legacy for this class particularly. Now, in addition to Owen, Jonathan Edwards, uh, known famously for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was an American, a little, he was a Puritan. He's considered a Puritan. He's a little bit after uh, the English Puritans. But he helps us see uh, the purpose for our existence. He really makes a big deal out of God's glory and how God created the whole universe uh, as a theater. Calvin would call it a theater of his glory, but Edwards really picked up on that theme. And everything we say and do is designed to increase God's glory back to himself. He also wrote extensively about the role that our affections or those deep-seated drives that bring us towards something in worship or away from it in disgust uh, play in, in our lives, and, and that's really important when we get into talking about specific counseling. So Edwards is, is very significant in this class. Another individual who's just as significant at, uh, as Edwards, but in a different way, is the Dutch Christian theologian by the name of Abraham Kuyper. Uh, Kuyper believed in something called sphere sovereignty, and, and he was he, he basically, to, in a nutshell, what sphere, sphere sovereignty talks about is it's, it's an emphasis upon the common grace of God and how God is allowed, his creation is essentially good before sin marred everything, and God has allowed different spheres, uh, political, uh, uh, medicine, 
government, all these things, uh, different disciplines to exist. Um, and so therefore, they're not created bad, but they're, they're, there are redemptive elements to each of those disciplines. And he has a famous quote that says something along the lines of, uh, there's not one inch of this universe that Jesus Christ does not scream mine, something along those, something like that. And so what, what we learn from Kuiper is that things like modern psychology, with all of its Darwinian evolutionary perspectives and, and, and its uh, truncated thinking, can still be redeemed for Jesus Christ. So we, we don't throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. We seek to learn, but we seek to learn with the proper lenses again, the proper spectacle of Scripture. And so Kuiper helps us with that. In addition to Kuiper, John Bunyan, famous for Pilgrim's Progress, an English Christian pastor, a Baptist actually, um, did jail time for preaching without a license. Um, he... Uh, Hold on just a second. I accidentally turned off the internet. Um, Piper, I mean, not Piper, Bunyan, forgive me the sounds here, everything's got to boot back up. Uh, Bunyan uh, was famous for his um, understanding of the relationship between law and grace and its implications for soul care. And so we'll, we'll be influenced by him this semester. Now, in addition to Bunyan, we also have, oops, I went too fast. Let me go back. Sorry. Richard Sibbs. Richard Sibbs is probably my favorite Puritan pastor. Sibbs, other than having a wonderful taste in, in hats, uh, he helps us remember that soul care at its heart is a pastoral ministry of the word. So often we get caught up in the 21st century of trying to be professional. And uh, as a professional, um, we sometimes lose the sight that we're there to help a hurting person as a pastor would. And hopefully Sibs's influence will be felt throughout this course as well. In addition to Sibs, a famous German monk by the name of Martin Luther, uh, Luther, remember, is the one that uh, started the Protestant Reformation. But he helps us understand the role of justi justification by faith. And he also helps us understand who we are in Jesus Christ and how that can play into our counseling methodology, goals, all those kind of things. So Luther's a very important influence as well. Well, we've seen that, that Christian counseling is distinctively Christian in its historical formation. But it's also, the next part of this would be, it's also distinctly Christian in its conceptualization. Um, what I mean by that is that to be a Christian means you have a certain worldview that you apply to everything. Remember what Kuiper said, that, that there's not one ounce of this universe, one inch of the universe, that Christ doesn't scream at his mind. And so that being the case, uh, our worldview helps us understand and it shapes and it, it basically helps us interpret reality. It provides an interpretive framework for us. And that's very important to know because people will come to you for counseling and they will be operating through a different interpretive framework. Uh, somebody may come to you and say, well, God wants me to be happy. Well, is that true? Does he call you to be happy or does he call you to be holy? I, I think of the Apostle Paul who God said, he must suffer great for my name's sake. And so it's not that we're not to alleviate suffering. We are. But the key here is also to understand that our worldview affects all the, the questions we ask, the answers we seek, and how we view things. And so we have to look at counseling, particularly that there are people, there are problems, and their prescriptions to those problems. And if we look at it from a secular perspective, we'll come up with certain answers. For instance, you know, from a counseling, uh, a counseling framework, if you will, people are understood by the discipline of psychology. 
This explains who people are. Well, there are limitations, of course, we know uh, with a psychological, modern psychology because it, it's naturalistic in its foundation. It, it denies the supernatural. It denies an afterlife, all those kind of things. It denies concepts of sin, quite frankly. But, but psychology is you as far as people go from a secular perspective. Well, but not everybody operates in a healthy fashion. So the secularist looks at that, and he or she says, well, they must have a psychopathology. Something's wrong with them. And so there's a lot of um, labeling, a lot of categorizing, which some of it's helpful. Some of it's very descriptive, by the way. But it, it's limited in the sense that it's truncated. It does not take in ethics. It does not take in the spiritual aspect of, of reality. It doesn't see all of reality. And so therefore, uh, it's, it's a little bit short-sighted. But, but that doesn't stop the, the modern psychologist from going about his or her task. And that would be to help people. And they help people through what we would call psychotherapy. Uh, psychology defines the person. Psychotherapy defines the ill. I mean, psychopathology defines the illness. Psychotherapy then defines the cure. So that, that's from a modern secular mindset, a modernist or a postmodern even uh, secular uh, mindset for counseling. Well, how do we as Christians interact with that? In other words, what, what, how do we, how does our worldview help us interpret those three things, people, problems, and their prescription to the problems? Well, we see the same data, but we look at it differently. When, when Christians look at people, they see them in a very special role created by a speaking, revealing God and created with meaning and purpose uh, to glorify that God. We're given a special role in creation, and we'll get into that as the semester goes, goes on. But we were designed for relationship with Him. We were made in His image, and so we're in this, this middle section, if you will. There, there's this God that's over on one side, and, and Schaefer used to say three circles. And, and God's over on one side in his circle, and he's outside of creation. And, and we're within creation, but we're different than the animals and the machines. Uh, we, are, we are different in the sense that animals and machines and, and trees and things are not created in the image of God. But we're like those created things because we're finite. On the other hand, we are like God in the fact we were created in His image, but since He's infinite and we're finite, we're not like Him. So we're sort of in the middle. And we've been given a very special task. Our creational mandate is to redeem, or not to redeem, that's after the fall, it's to cultivate this culture. It's to work the garden, so to speak. It's to have dominion over all this creation. It's to glorify God. And so that's how things were designed to be. However, that would be our psychology. However, things did go wrong. Um, the, the secularist and the Christian would see the same thing. The, the, the explanations would be different. For the Christian, what went wrong occurred in Genesis 3. And there was a fall. And mighty was that fall. And in that fall, Schaefer says that humans experienced alienation from God alienation from each other because the next chapter over uh, two brothers are in a fight and one kills the other but this is an important concept alienation from ourselves this is where uh, indwelling sin leads us to self-deception and we see that through scripture and it, it gives us blind spots and our biggest problem is that the three circles we talked about a moment ago we want to live in God's circle but we're finite and we can't do it and so therefore we're caught. And, therefore, and, and as a result, uh, our desire to be God leads us to do some pretty wacky things that are very pathological. And that, that's the fall. Uh, it also uh, brings about not only sin. It's, it's sin, by the way, is not just a, a, uh, a behavior. It's a state of being that opposes God and wants to run things their, our own way. But see, our sin is sin, but there are other sins that affect us that, alleviate, I mean, that bring about suffering. And so uh, Ecclesiastes 1.15 talks about Solomon in his life. He looks around at all, all the creation and he says, what is crooked cannot be straightened and what is lacking cannot be counted. 
he realized that in a fallen world, uh, sin and suffering run rampant. And that's the Christian answer. There's a fall. Now, whereas the the secularist will say, okay, you need therapy. You need me to stand in uh, between you and your problem and help you find this inner strength and resiliency to overcome this problem. The Christian view has a different take on it. And the Christian view says you can't solve your problem from within. That is your problem. It permeates your very soul. You need help from the outside. And this is where we offer redemption through Jesus Christ. And he comes to not only heal, but bind up as well, and uh, to defeat uh, the powers of evil, the world of flesh, the devil. And we'll get into that as the, uh, as the semester unfolds. But those, those are some of the differences in, in the Christian understanding or conceptualization of people, uh, their problems, and the pres uh, pres uh, prescription for those problems, and that of the secularist. And so, okay, so we see that that Christian counseling is distinctively Christian in its historical formation, is distinctively Christian in its goal, I mean, I'm sorry, in its uh, conceptualization, and it's also distinctively Christian in its goal. What do I mean by that? Well, God's goal for the entire universe is His glory. Uh, God did not create humanity because he was missing something. God, before he created, he related in the Trinity. He had everything he wanted, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he needed not us. But what he decided to do was he wanted to create, as Calvin would say, a theater for his glory. Now, Edwards picks up on this as well. But he created a place a physical location, and he created images of himself to relate to, and the primary purpose of those images was to reflect that glory throughout the creation and back to God in praise and worship. And so God's goal for everything is his glory, which means our goal has to be God's glory as well for those we counsel. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, we're trying to increase the person's glory-reflecting capacities so that they can more brightly reflect God's glory. So that being said, that's kind of what we're about. Now, how do we go about that task? Well, 1 Peter 4, 2 Corinthians 5, I've kind of put those together. But as ambassadors of Christ, we are administrators of God's grace in reorienting disoriented people to Christ through the ministry of reconciliation. We are ministers of reconciliation as counselors. I don't care what uh, DSM category a person falls in, we are still ministers of reconciliation. We stand in the gap. We are conduits of His grace that we administer to hurting and sinful people and helping them experience the goodness and glory of God. So that's what we're trying to do came across this quote a few years ago that J.I. Packer wrote relating to preaching, but I think it's very uh, applicable uh, to counseling as well. Packer says this, our, our commission is to declare the whole counsel of God, but the cross is the center of that counsel. And the traveler through the Bible landscape misses his way as soon as he loses sight of the hill called Calvary. And I think you're, you're pursuing a wonderful education here with some of the top teachers in the world, especially the counseling faculty. And I just want to remind you that regardless of how adept you get at the different skills and techniques and theoretical understandings that, that, that you accumulate in your time here, uh, you can never lose sight of that hill called Calvary. Because when you do, um, things will, will go off the rails for you. So... That's just a thought. So we've seen that the Christian or the counseling is distinctively Christian in its historical historical formation, in its conceptualization, uh, in its goals, but it's also distinctively Christian in its content. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got to learn to to think about people, their problems, and and the prescription of those problems via two-way interpretation. And here's what I mean. 
you're studying your Bible, you're, you're worshiping, you're having a good time with the Lord, and, and the text is, is uh, the, via the Holy Spirit is going deeper into your soul. Well, there will be times when a person comes to you and a biblical text will come from you through your heart, through your theological grid, into that person's experience. So you will be interpreting from the Bible to the person. But that's not the only way. Now, typically, preaching, although it applies to, to, to people individually, tends to be that way because it's a monologue. It's a person standing in a pulpit preaching, and he is exhorting or whatever, but it's going one way. And this is one of those interpretation ways that you could look at it that way. But counseling is more one-on-one -on -one ministry. It's very personal. Uh, it's not a wide application. You know, in our church, we have 3,000 every Sunday. I can't imagine our pastor being able to specifically apply a given text to 3,000 people in 3,000 different ways. So, so that's one way, interpretation. But the other way is through what Bonhoeffer would call an act of love, and that's listening well. It's allowing that person's experience or their story to unfold, running that through the grid of your theology, and then finding a biblical text. Uh, so it goes from the, in this situation, it goes from the person back to the Bible. And so, so there's two ways. There's from the Bible to the person and then the person to the Bible. That's what we mean by two-way interpretation. Well, in addition to the things we've talked before, counseling is also distinctively Christian in its methods. There are a lot of things we can do, but, but honestly, from a Christian perspective, I think it's long lost or thought that, well, it's only helpful to highly reflective clients or to, you know, to, to uh, those that are, are really not that ill. But the spiritual disciplines brought about through the means of grace can be very therapeutic. And if you, if you take any time to read research from secular, secular sources, you will see that a lot of the things that the modern psychologist is doing, many of those things are adaptations of, of means of grace that the church has used for 2,000 years. So we will focus on those kinds of techniques, if you will, as we learn about counseling, because it makes it distinctively Christian. Because what we're really trying to promote and cultivate, if you think about it, is a fear of the Lord. If we can cultivate a fear of the Lord, we're going to, to really help hurting people find God and find His grace. Okay. All right, to summarize what I've said for this lecture, counseling is distinctively Christian in its historical formation. You stand on the shoulders of many great saints that have come before you that thought long and hard and deeply about problems of the soul, and it would be very wise for you to benefit from that, from those, those teachers. Counseling is also distinctively Christian in its goal. We're all about God's glory. Counseling is distinctively Christian in its content. It's all about bringing the Bible to life in a person's experience. It's all about allowing God to speak through you in such a way that you incarnate Christ and you serve as a conduit, not a cul-de-sac, a conduit of His grace into the life and heart of a hurting person. And it's distinctively Christian in its methods. I don't think primal scream therapy is a biblical concept. Therefore, you won't be learning it here. So, so those kind of things, we need to make sure that we're, we're approaching them Christianly. With all that said, uh, once again, I want to welcome you to class. I look forward to seeing you in person uh, next week. I will be back uh, from my trip. So if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to email me. Uh, on the syllabus is also my cell phone number in case there's an emergency. But remember now, after you watch this, uh, there is a uh, quiz uh, in, in Sakai that you'll be taking and it's going to be limited. You can't just wait to the last minute. This, this needs to be taken within a certain time frame, and it's 2.5% of your grade. So I'd like to ask that you, you know, take your notes. You can watch this again if you need to, but go ahead and get that exam out of the way, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next week.
God bless.